Hi everybody. Bonjour et bienvenue. Bonjour à tous. Uh, welcome everybody to this Otaku live interview. So I'm going to make a short introduction in French and then translate it in English right after that. Uh, donc bonjour à tous. Je m'appelle Amé, uh, Amélie. Et je viens donc de d'Otaku, comme vous le savez probablement. Et uh, donc Otaku, c'est le seul réseau de librairies spécialisée manga au Québec, uh, avec bien sûr une équipe de passionnés en manga. Et ce soir, on reçoit Frédéric Jones, qui est le fondateur de la revue manga Saturday AM et qui va nous parler de la diversité dans les mangas. Donc, la rencontre va se passer uniquement en anglais et euh, n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions via le chat et on va essayer de les poser à Frédéric au fur et à mesure. So, welcome everybody. My name is Ame. Uh, I'm CEO of Otaku Bookstores, uh, this, which is uh, the only bookstore network uh, that is specialized in manga in Canada. Uh, so, the, today we have the pleasure to welcome uh, among us uh, Frédéric Jones. Hi, Frédéric. Hey, <laughs> Frederick is the founder of Saturday AM uh, Manga Magazine in the United States uh, and is here to talk about diversity in manga. So the whole interview will be held in English. Uh, you will be able to ask your questions through the chat. Um, so as I said, Frederick is the founder of Saturday AM. So it's an American manga magazine which aim to promote mangas produced worldwide. Um, and it, it, mangas are that are with characters or themes that represent diversity in all its forms. Uh, Frederick works with a lot of uh, a group of collaborators uh, who come from all over, all over the world. And he's going to tell us more about his uh, initiative today and i promise his english is better than mine <laughs> <So>. <laughs> frederick thank you so much for uh, being us with uh, being with us today uh to begin with can you talk a bit about you who you are uh how the idea of saturday am came up to you yeah well first of all i want to say thank you very much for a chance to meet your your audience and to uh, talk to the canadian people um Uh, I'm always in awe, you know, been doing, uh, I've been, you know, in the entertainment business for close to 20 years and I've been doing Saturday AM nearly a decade and I'm always in awe of uh, people who can speak multiple languages. It's just, a, it's, it's a, as someone who butchers English as a normal thing, it is uh, always an honor to uh, speak to people who are able to process all of this and, and speak with uh, different uh, different languages but um yeah um as you said you know um i you know saturday am is uh it's it's a definite love uh of mine um uh, it's something where i am uh, focused on uh, developing uh manga that speaks to authenticity of different uh, uh individual backgrounds uh typically when we think of manga of course we think of it as japanese uh, we think of it with asian protagonists And what we saw when we looked at manga as a art form was that we saw people around the world, uh, obviously, who love it, who are from India, who are from Africa, who are from uh, countries in Latin America, people sure. who look like me, people who you know, are um, people who have different uh, body types, because I think one thing we don't talk about a lot in manga is how every character typically is very thin, which is obviously a standard, uh, typically in, in, um, in Asian uh, communities. So. Mm -hmm. So we just really wanted to uh, take the start form that we love and kind of uh, recalibrate it or, or, or maybe evolve it if we're fortunate to be something that is representative, not just in terms of its fan base, because right now manga is already very diverse, but to make it just make it representative in this diversity in terms of the characters you're reading about. Same story, same action, same dynamic character designs but to bring uh, just a, a more uh, global palette to the individual faces that you see uh, in the stories. And beyond that, um, of course, is the idea that we wanted to take these amazing creators who are operating in the Japanese manga art style, um, you know, the same way that American comic books were very, uh, were very uh, recognizable around the world in the 50s, And then later in the 60s and 70s with Jack Kirby, uh, 50s with uh, Andy Warhol and his pop art movement, it became a very, everyone in the world kind of understood when they saw it, they knew, they knew what it meant. Anime manga, I don't think it just gets discussed enough about how inf influential it is, how people in Rwanda may have, been, you know, may have only ever really been exposed to manga and therefore that's all they know visually when they think of comic books. Like they know about Superman, they know about Iron Man, 
But when they think of like putting pen to paper and creating or something uh, in two dimensions, they think of anime and manga. And because of the, the power of the influence that manga has had, you know, what we discovered is that there were a number of creators from Canada, the United States, the UK, and then all the way throughout the rest of the world who, this is how they draw. Like there is no native way for them to draw. They've only ever drawn in the manga style. And so we saw as, as well as opportunity to not just try to hopefully add a bit of, add some more texture to manga in terms of the characters that are featured, but more texture in terms of the actual things that are being depicted because uh, so many of the creators nowadays have manga as a blueprint. Um, and so to that point, as you indicated, um, when I looked at all these factors, I decided that, you know, what, 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 I want, what I really would love to see was a brand that would operate just like a traditional Japanese manga magazine. So it'd be an anthology format. It would have lots of stories in it from different creators. Um, the series would be series that we believe had really strong um, elements to them that, that could make people excited. So stories that involve fantasy or sci-fi or magic or, or you know action or romance and um, and to make sure that we had creators that we believed in that were really talented um, and to put it all together in, into something that felt like weekly shown and jump but would be more global so that's where Saturday M came from and we did it initially as a digital manga magazine so people can actually explore it on their uh, on their uh, laptops or their iPads or Android devices um, and recently we've signed a book deal to bring them to, uh, to physical uh, books, so nice. that an actual graphic novels. So that's, that's kind of the whole kind of like thing in a nutshell, but there's a lot more obviously we can talk about, but that's kind of the genesis of, of the brand. And, and, how, and when and how did it all start? I, I understood that you simply created like a Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, well, so when I first had the idea, I was coming from, you know, a, a time in the video game industry, I've been in the video game industry for about a decade at that point, and I was coming off of that, and I was looking to, you know, to, 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 for, to follow my first love, which was comic books, and uh, social media hadn't quite got to where it is today, right, we look at social media today, and it seems normal, but, you know, 10, 12 years ago, it just, it wasn't where it is today, and so um, I had uh, originally planned to do a website, where we would just kind of profile some of these artists because I would see these artists on different websites and think, man, like, wow, this person's from Nigeria or this person's from the UK, but they, they're not Asian and they draw like so expert. Like I would never have known that they weren't, you know, a Japanese mangaka. And uh, so we started a website initially and then I had the idea that, you know, I really love to manage some of these people and kind of help them because I did have all these contacts in video games and, and, uh, and, and anime and, and, and uh, toys and so forth. And what happened was that like, so I started seeing a lot of incredibly diverse creators and I thought, man, like, you know, these guys, you know, right now it's hard to find them because social media wasn't really perfected yet. It was social media where, where it was. The websites weren't really set up like Webtoon and things existed, but they hadn't quite made a penetration into the rest of the world. They were mostly a Korean thing. So at that point, you know, we decided to create a, a magazine and we, we had the first five creators we discovered through DeviantArt. And that's how we basically were able to kind of put together some of these creators. I discovered one or two of them, Raymond Brown and then White Manga. And then from there, we were able to get more creators. But then once the, once the, uh, the website went live uh, and once the magazine became available for people to download, we were getting people approaching us from everywhere. So, uh, so we started just pursuing social media at that point just to make sure we had a presence everywhere. Uh, so we had a Facebook group where a lot of people came, like you said, that's not active anymore, but we had a Facebook group at one point. We have a, a, a very active Instagram account, um, you know, Twitter, you know, YouTube and so on. So yeah, it started first just with the website and then it kind of slowly grew into other areas. So where are your authors coming from? And how many, how many authors do you publish? Uh, right now, uh, in terms of the exclusive creators that we have, it's over 40, I think. Uh, it was like 45. Um, and the, they hail from basically six out of seven continents. So we've got, I think like, uh, eight different countries or no, we've got eight creators out of Africa. Uh, and I think that represents maybe six countries, uh, nice. Senegal, South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, um, 
I feel like I'm missing one, but that's, that's, that's a good chunk of them. And then we have uh, some creators, uh, quite a few creators out of Europe, everywhere from Greece and, and uh, Cyprus to uh, the UK and, um, and Lithuania. We have creators out of Australia, New Zealand, we have creators out of America, Brazil, um, uh, parts of Latin America. We're in talk to some more countries, uh, France. So, um, so yeah, we just have, um, we have, uh, again, six out of seven continents. Yeah, we have a lot of people right now and keep growing. Yeah, and this diversity brings a lot of richness to to all to all of this, and it's it's amazing what you've done actually. Um, and um, you you said that you worked in the video game industry. Uh, how did this uh, How did this experience help your mission? The it, well, it helped in two ways, right? So the first way it helped it was that I was very fortunate to have a career in the industry. Um, I learned a lot. I traveled around the world. I worked on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, video game launches and projects that I was a big fan of. But I also, because of all of that, I got to see a lot of, I got to be in a lot of meetings and I would be typically the only person of color in those meetings. And oh. I got to realize how, you know, here's the video game industry, which is this gigantic industry that, that you know, reaches people around the world. And the people who are making decisions, the people who are helping to usher it along, for the most part, were very, uh, I mean, you know, I, I was the only person uh, of color, not, clown, not counting, of course, the Japanese, but, uh, you know, as a person that's black or brown, mm. I was the only person that, that I would see. That has changed in recent years, but uh, certainly the decade or so I was in it, you know, I was typically be the only black person I would see in meetings. Uh, I remember when I went to my first E3, I didn't see a lot of women either. Like it was rare to see a lot of women uh, in, in major positions there, aside from cosplay and things like that. So it was really, uh, it was really interesting, um, uh, my time in the industry, because I had a chance just to see how you could have a really popular form of entertainment, but yet at the same time, not have a lot of representation helping to direct it. And so then you would see things like, the, for example, the lack of, you know, black or brown characters in video games. And you wonder like, well, is that just because they think that people don't play video games who are black and brown, or is it because they don't think that people would care about black and brown characters? And you realize that no, it's probably just the fact that there weren't a lot of people who look like me mm. in those meetings, even talking about the characters or talking about how they were going to market the game and so forth. And so when you remove diversity from the construction of content, then inevitably the result is just a lack of diverse characters and content in the first place. And so that that really inspired me with creating Saturday AM to make sure that we had everybody um, that, you know, that we had a company that had as much diversity as possible throughout it. I understand. So how, how your initiative is um, currently received by the public in USA? Oh, I, I, I you know, uh, it's, it's been received very well. I mean, we've had a lot of success, you know. Um, That's who here is. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I mean, listen, when we launched, uh, I was told, I actually, I did an interview earlier today um, and, I, and I, I was telling, so I got to ask a similar question and I, I was explaining to them this, this note we got uh, our very first year, very first couple of months into it. And it's it a note that I still remember to this day. And it was about a young person. I think they were from Africa. Um, I can't remember which country, but they were talking about how they got really emotional mm -hmm. uh, because they were, they were talking about how they had always loved manga, uh, what little they had seen of it. And, but they were always concerned because they didn't feel that, um, and they were being told that they couldn't ever be a part of it. And so when they saw us, like just the sheer fact that they saw that we existed, like it just transformed their view of things because just the fact that we existed, that, that the thing that they had wanted to do wasn't so strange. It wasn't, it wasn't something they had to feel bad about or that they were wasting their time. They could actually, through us, you know, have the strength to pursue this. And, when I was telling the young woman this today, who was interviewing me, she was like, yeah, she's like, wow, that's crazy to think. And I started, she and I started talking, I was saying to her, I'm like, we well, got to remember what was so fascinating about this was that this was before Black Panther came out. This was before Miles Morales debuted from Spider-Man. So we think of it today as like, well, of course, diversity makes sense. Like, of course, but that's just how, it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, it's true. How, yeah, just how limited diversity was, even though we all know diverse characters and so forth. But like, even in popular entertainment, it was such a narrow and, and rare thing to see 
that uh, the Saturday AM, you know, uh, when we created it, when we launched it, it immediately had an impact. We immediately felt love from people. And that's not to say that there weren't people who were, uh, you know, who were hostile to diversity. There always have been, but but uh, but for the most part, it was really exciting uh, and has always been exciting to see people be uh, touched by what we were doing. So we have a fan base that, uh, you know, over 60 countries visit us regularly. Uh, we've had visitors from over 100 countries. We have uh, fans who, uh, you know, obviously come from every background possible, Black, white, uh, Latino, Asian, Arabic, Jewish, um, you know, folks who are uh, LGBTQ, folks who are, are very, who identify, you know, heavily with their religion. And we've been very um, happy that everyone feels that they have a home with us because we want them to feel comfortable with us. Well, um, just a little break to remind people that uh, don't forget to ask your questions through the chat so I can uh, transfer them to to Frederick. So don't hesitate to 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 ask any question. I'm sure I will be glad to answer them. I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> Frederick, can you talk a little bit more about what you published right now, what you have accomplished to do so far? Uh, you, you, yeah, you were you. You're very, very kind to uh, to send me some uh, chapters of what you what you published. So I I read them all, uh, but I want to hear that from you. Yeah, well, uh, <clears throat> you know, when we started Saturday AM, of course, I think most people when they think of manga, right? Um, especially those of us in the West, because we're exposed to it for the first time, we tend to be exposed to the things that are most popular. And I think a lot of people, I think, sometimes don't recognize just how massive the manga industry is in Japan. And by that, I mean that there are titles that are in Japan that are being published right now, where the creators are making a living, where they're happy, they're raising families off their comic work. And it's a property that you and I, and many of your, the viewers of this, many of your customers who come into your stores, they'll never see these properties because they'll never make it outside of Japan. So that's how big the market is. You can have an entire career, you can have a big hit in Japan off of manga, and it still doesn't get an anime, doesn't end up in the West, doesn't end up the rest of the world, doesn't end up translated or scanlated or whatever. And so I think that, you know, that level of just like having a really rich diversity of content and creators is really important to us. So when we started Saturday AM, you know, we, we always had the idea to branch into other areas, but obviously from a business standpoint, we wanted to go where most of the fans were in the West. Um, and so uh, Saturday AM is mostly a shonen type of manga magazine. It typically tends to be things that are like okay. Dragon Ball or Naruto, that type of stuff. But uh, in recent years, we've been fortunate to debut two uh, different spinoffs. Um, we have a spin or three, actually. We have a spinoff called Saturday PM, which is devoted to uh, more adult male content. So it's called Saini uh, Manga. We have some amazing creators in that. We have, uh, including our first creator who uh, lives in Japan. We have um, Saturday Brunch, which is devoted to Jose or more female oriented content. And okay. we have some amazing creators from there, from Denmark and from Germany. Um, and and, uh, and then we have a new line we just launched, which is more on the web comic or webtoon side called uh, Pilot Manga or Saturday Afternoon. And uh, and those are just fun shonen and, and, and shoujo type of titles that people can get into. But um, in terms of uh, the type of content we have, you know, we have uh, our biggest series is called Apple Black. And it's a wonderful, just really rich and exciting uh, fantasy so adventure. Yeah, yeah, just really, really fantastic. If you can see with the artwork, it's gorgeous. I mean, it looks like you would not know it wasn't Japanese. Oh, really yeah. Cool. I have to admit that it was my favorite drawing from oh, yeah. all of what you sent. Absolutely. It's, the drawing's amazing. It, it really is. I mean, and White Manga, who's the creator of that, is an incredibly talented young man. He's from Nigeria. Uh, he is just phenomenal. Um, he's got fans around the world, got a huge following on YouTube. So, uh, so yeah, so, so Apple Black is our big, big title. We have a second title, it's really big, called Clock Striker, and that stars a African-American female lead character, and that's really big as well. And, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to show. <laughs> no, it's gorgeous. It really is. And so, yeah. yeah. Those are, you know, those are two of our biggest series. We've got several series, though. We have an isekai series kind of called Saigami. We have a Yu-Gi-Oh type series called Mastery Multiplayer World of Ghosts, which features an Indian League character. Um, we have uh, Oblivion Rude, which features a uh, all African cast. 
uh, and, and employees with Afrofuturism. We have a title called Titan King, which has a Honduran uh, lead character from the country of Honduras. The, the plot begins there. So, you know, um, we were just, you know, we've been really fortunate to have so many great creators from different, different uh, genres. We have horror, we have thrillers, we have uh, not quite romance, not yet. We have get comedy, we have action, we have fantasy, we have sci-fi. So, yeah, we, we, we're, we're pretty happy with that. Uh, yeah, it's very diverse in the themes uh, and the, the the styles too. And what I particularly liked is that every author is in front of the scene. Uh, yeah. There is uh, some biography and some some details about the authors, so uh, we can see that they're really important for you. And I assume that you also are an author yourself, right? Yeah, I, I, I am. I mean, I don't consider myself much of an author, but yeah, I mean, I uh, two of our biggest series I write, um, uh, and, and I write and I write a few more. I've created a few of the series as well. But uh, yeah, Mass Multiplayer World of Ghosts, that's the title. Um, and that um, is illustrated by an incredible young artist out of New Zealand named Oscar Fong. And he's uh, super, super talented. Um, and uh, is, is that uh, in log? Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous, yeah. yeah. And so that, you know, that what's really cool about that one is that, again, it's an Indian American Lee character. It's got very much a Yu-Gi-Oh type of vibe to it. So the kid can summon these video game type characters to fight his battles. and He's trying to find out what happened to his mother, and and uh, and we took we the story takes place in Hong Kong and in North Carolina here in the United States, and eventually it'll go to India and some other places. So we really love that uh, aspect of it that we can get really granular and have a character that that you know lives in the world that we live in, right? It's not like just America or just India or just something like that. But it's, it's everywhere. Um, like I said, I write a series called Clock Striker, and then I've, I've, I don't know if you have this uh, arc here, but this other title I'm really proud of is called Yellow Stringer. Oh yeah, I read it too. Yeah, yeah. So this is nice. Really, Very different. Yeah, so this one is really uh, this is saying so it's more adult. And uh, this one, what I love about this one is that it's got these two characters that are. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're adults, and they're very, um, they're very different from one another. <laughs> She's a, uh, a, a Ivy League uh, journalist who could probably win a Pulitzer one day but Instead, she works this really crappy newspaper called the Yellow Springer, which is like, you know, there's their 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 stories are like things like Demon Baby born in in British Columbia, you know, over breakfast, or you know, like just like a really stupid kind of concept. But uh, but but it turns out that the stuff that they're reporting on is real, and so it's got a lot of comedy, it's got a lot of horror, it's got a lot of drama to it. The creatures we try to make the creatures more modern, so we have a version of the Headless Horseman, which is more modern in context and stuff. So. So we really, we really hope that that series it's got a wonderful artist named Jeffrey John Luis, who is uh, from Haiti, and uh, and so we just hope that that the series, uh, these series again, just for everybody, it's something that's different and unique for everybody. So yeah, so we're yeah, so I, I write a few of them, but I'm, I'm really proud of all the creators in particular. Yeah, I, I was happy to see the uh, the name of uh, of the of the author because my last name is the same. So oh. I'm not I'm not from IT, but my last name is the same. So so I was like, hey, nice. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> Frederick. I have a pretty different question that was asked by private message uh, by somebody who's listening to us, um, who says that some people may argue that if manga does uh, not originally come from Japan, it's not really manga. <laughs> That's what the the, 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 the the person said, so uh, what asked. So what is your take on this? Yeah, so so first of all, we, you know, we've, we've, got, we've gotten that question many times. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say for that person, if anyone listening to it, that those questions don't always come across uh, or, or always, I think sometimes come across as genuine because sometimes it just seems to be more anti-diversity, like, well, you know, I was talking about this with somebody the other day uh, because, you know, Saturday M has a strong relationship with the Japanese community. We have, we're talking to a big company right now to Japan for some stuff that we hope to announce soon. We've done, done partnerships with Wacom and Celsius, which makes Clip Studio Paint and Sakura, which makes the markers. These are three of the biggest companies who most of the manga you may read today are, or, or comic books for that matter, are created by uh, or use the, sorry, the tools of these companies. And so I say that, and so my point in saying that is that, uh, you know, as a 48 year old man who's been traveling around the world, been involved in business and entertainment for years, I've never heard someone Japanese make that comment. So again, like, I, I don't know the sincerity of those comments sometimes. 
because the Japanese never seem to have that issue. We've talked to many Japanese, we do a lot of business with them. It seems to be more so from people who want to create the idea that manga can only exist the way they want it to exist. And so what I say to that, to then if that, if that person or anyone who has that question uh, wants to have a serious discussion about it, is uh, manga in a lot of ways is very similar to hip hop. Hip hop is a uniquely black thing. It's a uniquely black American thing. That doesn't mean there aren't people who do hip hop in Canada or the UK. That doesn't mean there aren't people who do hip hop who look like, you know, who look like you, Emily, or look like, you know, someone different from you and I, right? Um, uh, we just had the Super Bowl and uh, one of the greatest hip hop artists of all time, uh, Eminem, uh, performed there amongst other luminaries in the hip hop space, all of which were black except for Eminem. And mm -hmm. I don't think anyone uh, looks at Eminem and thinks that he's not hip hop. So I, again, I find the, the conversation to be a bit disingenuous because we, we find a way somehow to not have these concerns when, when, when we want it to fit the narrative that we want. At the end of the day, comics, manga is just comics. That's really all it is. So people who have never been to Japan, as someone who has been to Japan, let me educate you, it's just comics. It's just comics. Again, the only people who ever seem to have an issue with it are people who don't actually live in Japan and are not actually Japanese. <laughs> it's just comics. And so if you're going to have that discussion about, well, what, what is it actually if it's not featuring Asian characters? Well, then you perhaps should take that up with the Japanese because they would look at Iron Man or Spider-Man and just consider them American manga. And I've literally had that discussion with them. So that literally is true. But in terms of you know, our approach to manga, I think at the end of the day, the biggest thing that motivates us is that number one, staying with the hip hop example for, for, for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, when you have creators who create content and are, um, are uh, you know, who create this, for example, say hip hop, and they're not uh, a black American, um, the question always is, do they have success? Do they have fans? Do they have people in their country who love what they do and perceive them to be you know, massively influential in what they do? So mm -hmm. let's take your country, for example. You have an artist that is very famous around the world for doing hip hop. He did not fit the hip hop mantra 15 years ago. In fact, people made fun of him 15 years ago because his background is being an actor on a show called Degrassi Junior High. But Drake is now one of the biggest artists in the world. He certainly is re regarded as one of the top hip hop artists, but he would not fit any person's definition, especially not of my generation, of being someone who has a hip hop pedigree. But he made it his, he made it his own, he made it work. And now no one questions it because he's been successful at it. And so I think that from that standpoint, again, you know, when you look at the various countries where young people are making manga, and we certainly have seen it ourselves, uh, they come to us all the time. Um, my question is always, well, if a kid comes to me and he makes manga in France, is he not a manga creator? He's got fans there. People are paying to buy his books from Ankama or Glano or some of the amazing companies there that produce manga. Is it not manga? The answer is it's manga as far as they're concerned. It's manga as far as their fans are concerned. So yeah, um, again, you know, I just think that it's, it's a conversation I think is worth having if people wanna have a real discussion about it. But <laughs> when you hear from the people who actually do this stuff and who actually have spoken to the Japanese, it's never nearly the controversy that people would like for it to be. So we make manga, <laughs> bottom line. <laughs> and it's people who don't fit in a certain category that make things progress in a way. Exactly. So yeah, That's so I, I really like your answer. <laughs> And, and it's true also that in Japanese language, manga just means comic in a general meaning. So I remember I had one person write me, and of course, again, it was a young person who's not Asian or not Japanese, and they were just adamant. And but, but the other part I have this too, again, is I'm a 48 year old man who's had a long cor corporate career in entertainment. I always do kind of, I have to laugh sometimes when I have a young person trying to school me as if somehow. I'm the one who doesn't know this stuff. Like I'm the one who's never been educated or actually traveled or dealt with these people professionally. Uh, they've just read about something maybe on a message board or on Twitter. And I just thought, and he was arguing me, he's like, what would you call Scooby-Doo? I'm like, well, I would call Scooby-Doo Scooby-Doo, but the Japanese consider it an American anime. And it just blew his mind. It's like, anime, it's not anime. It can't be anime. I'm like, I don't make the rules, man. I'm just telling you what they say. Because <laughs> I've had those discussions. You go to Japan, ask them what Rick and Morty is. They're going to tell you it's American anime, kids. Um, so your, uh, your your magazine did quite, is quite different from what we know usually because it's uh, 
partly owned uh, by authors, right? Right. That's right. That's right. And I was actually going to pull it up here, just the app here. So if you guys, if you do get a chance, if you download our app, if you have a device, that is the app right there. It's called Saturday. We get this beautiful artwork from White Manga. And then you can go in here, you can see just tons of content that you can explore. And uh, all of the latest issues of our magazines are free. They're very easy to, uh, to uh, access, as you can see here. So pretty straightforward. Um, but yes, uh, Saturday AM as a company, we are owned um, uh, by the people who work on the magazine. We're not owned by an independent company. We're not owned by an investment firm or a toy company or a car or animation company. We're owned strictly by the people who do the work. And, uh, and so that means that uh, even the series that we publish, well, we make sure that they're owned by the creators. We believe that the creators uh, should have a legacy that they can take with them, with their children and their you know, estates and so on and so forth. So, uh, in their community. Um, so yeah, so for us, it's a really big deal um, that we um, have an environment where people feel that they uh, won't be taken advantage of and that they are part of something that, uh, that they get to play a role in directing how it, how it goes. And so it's really important for us. So. And how does it work? At which point of the uh, the creative process do you consider application for for young authors? Well, I mean, so we have a couple of different ways for young creators to uh, reach us, and we have a couple of different ways to to man to monitor creators. We have we have staffs, we have folks who do uh, editorial, we have staffs who do creators who uh, staff who does marketing, um, staff who uh, uh, we're getting to a point where we have staff who will do lettering as well because we need we need to prepare for that for the graphic novels or the tanker bonds. And so, um, so I think, you know, ultimately for us, uh, the challenge with it is, um, you know, because it's not set up the way the Japanese normally set things up, um, and because the market obviously is much bigger in Japan. I mean, we're all chasing the Japanese market. But, um, you know, typically in Japan is very cutthroat. So if you produce a comic, I'm sure as you know, if you produce a comic book, you know, you, we, we may like it here in America, but if it didn't do well in Japan, at least you know, the way it has been thus far, they'll kill it. They'll kill it in a heartbeat. And so you next thing you know, you're like, I've really been enjoying this. You're like, oh, it's ending in two volumes. What? What happened? And uh, so, um, you know, we don't quite operate that way since our stuff is digital and because we're dealing with the global audience. And plus, you know, we really want to have, we want the creators to have time to discover, to to grow. And most of our creators are, are either first-time creators or semi-professional at best. And so that means that we need to give them space. I think, you, I think when you come to diversity, if you really care about diversity, you have to therefore give the creators space, give them time to find their voice and find their truth. Um, doesn't mean you can always give it as much time as they might want and need, but you try to at least make an effort for that. And I think that for us, um, you know, we try to monitor it. We try to see where the story is going with. We try to make sure the stories feel to us original and feel uh, not necessary, but feel like they're offering something we haven't seen before. Um, and, uh, and if those things work, and if we feel like the creator is, you know, making content that feels, yeah, I think manga has a rhythm to it, just like music again. I think manga has a rhythm. I think when you read an American comic book or a French comic book or a, a or, or, or a, a, a English comic book from the UK, they all have different rhythms. They're things that, that, that they kind of give you a sense of, of just the culture and what shapes it. Manga's rhythm is very, just it's very quick. Like even when it's just like a, a very languid sort of experience, it still kind of has a sense of motion and movement of, of kind of this kinetic dynamism to it. And I think when you care about that and you want to try to make that happen, then what you do is you do try to uh, work to, again, give the, give the, create the magazines like we have, create the way the magazines get released to the fans uh, and to try to give their space for the creators to then let the stories kind of move with some, some, some tempo to it. Um, and if we feel like all that stuff is happening, we feel like the story is moving at a good pace, it's pacing well, every issue kind of has like a, a sense that you want to, you can't wait till the next issue. Um, if the artwork is looking solid, if we feel like the character designs are really, really cool and interesting, um, then yeah, we, we go as far, we go as long as we can. Um, but if we feel like there's some of those things are amiss, then we might, you know, pull back or try to sit the creator down and say, hey, let's talk about what's working, what's not working. We, by being a digital company, by having the magazine come out digitally, we do have a number of statistics that we can look at to help the creator understand where the traffic's coming from, whether or not people are reading their stories completely. So there are things that we can do to kind of help them, you know, find their voice maybe a little bit. 
and you're talking about what's working and what's not working. Um, I think what makes one of the things that makes a series work is when young readers can identi identify themselves to heroes. Do you think diversity helps this phenomena of identification? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, without question. You know, I, like I said, again, you know, being a black man and, and leading a company to the Cape I mean, I've certainly had a number of challenges uh, from people trying to, you know, trying to uh, understand where I'm coming from with it. And I think one of the questions does come up, it comes up quite a bit, actually, about the notion of, you know, is diversity more important than story? And I think that's such a false question. I think it's such a false question. It's like, that's such a, such a, uh, just, just such a lame false question, because obviously diversity does not trump story. On the other hand, diversity inspires story. Mm. You know, diversity actually powers good story. You know, what is P uh, Spider Man and Peter Parker except Batman if he were broke and had no money? <laughs> like, you know, like, like what is Spider Man if not that? What is uh, Batman if, if not Superman except he had to hide who he is? Uh, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't like wear his face out and fight crime. He had to actually put on a mask and try to terrify people because he had no powers. Like, diversity informs story. And, um, and I think with, uh, with us, you know, um, you know, manga is incredibly diverse, um, not diverse ethnically, of course, and, and therein lies why Saturday M exists, but, but it's incredibly diverse. And if we talk about the manga that you like and that I like, right, like one of my favorite manga right now is called Vinland Saga. I'm sure you oh, have heard. Yeah, yeah, love it. It's awesome. Now, the creator of that even is not a Norwegian white man, right? He's a Japanese guy that lives in the mountains of Japan. Um, you know, I think that, uh, or at least he lived there at one point based on some of the articles I had read. And I think that what makes that, that story so amazing is just the level of detail and the level of, the, the setting is different than we normally get in manga and the detail to the lives these characters had to have to live is so different from what we'd see in manga, so different from our own lives. And so, if you truly care about story, that's what you want. You want a story that's gonna take you somewhere different, it's gonna introduce you to different ideas and gonna challenge your perception of things. I'm not a white guy, yet I'm often, you know, you're not a white man, and yet we're often asked to read content or watch content with white people and see yeah. ourselves in it. Yeah. And my yeah. thing is always like, well, can people not see themselves in black people or Indian people or Latino people or gay people? Like somehow what makes that, what makes that the strange thing? And yet somehow what asking everyone else to see their content and be like, you know, yeah, this is awesome and not be able to see yourselves. And I see myself in Peter Parker uh, all the time, uh, but I'm not a white kid from New York. And I think that, so therefore I think it's just a bit um, strange to me how that question gets asked about can you see yourself in characters? Char great characters are great characters in diversity by just simply changing things that make that character who they are. That's interesting. And interesting things should make all of us who love story more excited because it's not something we've seen before. And so, yeah, I think, um, I think there's a definite benefit to inspiring young people uh, of color, young uh, LGBTQ kids, young uh, people from different countries. Uh, young people where English is not their first language. I think there's definitely something really exciting for us to show those type of characters in our stories. But I also think there's a benefit to people who maybe do represent the majority, uh, who maybe have never seen or, or, or even gave themselves an opportunity to enjoy stories with people who don't look like them. Uh, and I think there's a benefit to that as well. And so I think that we, we just try to tell great stories and we let diversity be the thing that inspires those great stories. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Frederica, I think we're reaching, uh, about to reach the end of the interview. So my one of my next question is, what are your hopes for future projects? What, what's going to happen? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, right now, obviously, we have these great graphic novels coming out, and we're really, really excited for these. Um, you know, these are the latest ones that we just got in the mail from Corto, which is our amazing partner that we have for these books. And, uh, and we're really excited uh, to be, for these to get out and for people to see them and have a chance to experience the stories with them and the great artwork and the great characters involved in it. 
Um, we've got some other big announcements that we have that, we're, that are coming uh, featuring our brand and our characters. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you know, what we're excited on right now is just a chance to reach more people like yourself and, and the people who shop in your stores with what we uh, hope are some really great stories they've never seen before. And the more that we can expose them to that, the more that, uh, that we can learn from them uh, as to what they like and what they don't like, the more we can uh, continue to try to produce new ideas that we think are really interesting that we've never seen before. Um, certainly, you know, we have a lot of fans who've been wanting to see our content get developed into uh, animation, and we're working on that. Um, over the past couple of years, our characters appeared as toys, and you guys can see some of the toys here. Um, actually, here's, here's one of the characters right here. So uh, it's kind yes. of uh, from Billy Eater. That's cool. It's a little collectible. Um, but, you know, uh, our characters appeared in a video game through, uh, which that the toys from Jabberwocky Toys, and the video game uh, was from uh, Flick Solitaire. It's a solitaire game for your iOS or Android. But we've, you know, we've had a chance to get our brand out there and have people really connect with our characters and our brand in different ways. And we've been really excited by that. Um, it's really, it's really rewarding to have so many people just get excited at the possibilities of what we have to offer. So we are working um, to just continue that process and to continue to, uh, thanks to Corto Group, to continue to put our stuff out there for people to discover. And we've got some really exciting things that we're going to be doing in, in the book format uh, for the next couple of years. Next year is the debut of Clock Striker, which is our big uh, big series outside of Apple Black, starring okay. a yeah, black female lead character. It's really popular. We're really excited for that to hit the market. Beautifully illustrated by a French artist named Asaka Galadina. Um, and this year as well, one of the things we're also excited about is we have, uh, as part of this whole makeup of books with uh, Corto, we have a how to draw book. And I don't have anything with me of that, but the how to draw book is really cool. Um, because again, you know, getting the manga aesthetic just right, but at the same time, being able to capture different ethnicities in an honest way um, and different you know, body types and so on and so forth, um, without it being too stereotypical. Um, you know, our folks are really, um, really passionate about that. And they really are excited about putting that together and uh, giving people a chance to learn how to do it. White Manga, as I indicated, who, who does the book uh, Apple Black, you know, uh, he is obviously a gigantic artist for us. And he's one of the principal uh, architects behind our How to Draw book. So people who love him and love his YouTube channel, uh, we'll really get a lot out of that, that book and, and that'll come out in June. So we've got a lot of stuff. We're excited. So. <laughs> and would, uh, would Apple Black will be your better recommendation? I mean, look, I recommend all of our stuff. I think all of our kids work really hard. I mean, they work really hard and they're really talented. I think if you, what I would say is for this first line of books that are coming out, um, if you, you know, if you want to see what a traditional manga done by someone who's not Japanese would feel like, then Apple Black for sure. If you want to see uh, a title that has uh, a lot of energy to it and maybe maybe has that kind of uh, that kind of quirkiness that you get like with the Chira Oda from One Piece and things like that, then you certainly want to check out Hammer uh, by Jay Oden, who's a, a fantastic artist. I really um, like this one. It was the the story was very like unseen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Are we very original? Yeah, the character is really strange and yeah. he's funny, and he's you, know, you really root for him. Um, Oblivion Rouge again. Uh, it's an all African cast. I think it's just it's such, such a it's such a and, unique experience. And the artwork is very very different too, like yeah, with different. all the colors and. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah. very very artistic. It's very artistic. It's, it's very like, artistic, right? Yeah, yeah very, it's, it's very much, uh, and for if you got, you know, for, for your reader, for your, your customers, I mean, and for people watching the video who know the term Afrofuturism, it's very much, it's got some of that in it as well. Um, Saigami by Sini from Hunk, she's a young artist out of Hungary. Uh, like I said, it's kind of an isekai, it deals with, with some issues regarding a female character really discovering herself. There's a lot, a lot of twists and turns in that story that I think people aren't going to really uh, be surprised by when it comes out. But it, it takes the isekai concept and maybe twist it just a little bit in ways I think people would be really excited by. Um, and she's a great artist as well, really, really, really talented artist. Uh, and so again, like, that, like I said, I think there's a lot of titles uh, that this first year that will be um, interesting for people who are interested in trying different things. But I think at the end of the day, yes, if you're looking for like your superhero shonen type of thing, I think Apple Black, you, you, could really, you can't go wrong with Apple Black. So, yeah. 
Nice. So if some of you uh, who are listening have some more questions for Frederick, now would be the best time to, to ask them. Uh, thank you, Frederick, for being here today, for explaining your mission um, in the world where we live in today. I think it's, it's much important to encourage diversity, tolerance, acceptance. Uh, so I think your mission is important and you seem to fulfill it well. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And yeah, I mean, we, you know, uh, we, again, we are, what I will say, what I do hope everyone understands is that we are a home for everybody. So, you know, we don't have a uh, political uh, point of view as a company, except for the political point of view that everybody matters. So if you're someone who maybe is, is um, becoming comfortable with diversity, maybe it's not something that you've always been uh, invested in, um, and you still maybe are a bit, a bit um, nervous about it we're a home for you. Like, we're not here to say that, that, um, that, you know, there's something wrong with you, you know, diversity is something everyone should be open to. Of course, we believe that, but we also believe that people should be able to come in and feel comfortable being able to explore to their, uh, levels of, 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 uh, of opportunity just to feel comfortable. And, and, uh, we're going to give you great content and if, whether our characters are black or Brown, gay or straight, um, you know, American or, or French or, or, you know, or, or, you know, or some other country. Uh, we think that you will uh, love the way that we've tried to construct the stories. And we think that you'll love these characters. I always tell people that, uh, what's that we call it? Inception. I was talking about Inception. I'm like, if I asked the average person who started Inception, they wouldn't know. They can't tell me who started Inception. They're like, I don't know. Was that uh, Tom Cruise? Like, no, it wasn't Tom Cruise. Was it uh, Will Smith? No, it wasn't Will Smith. But they can tell me about the train scene where it goes, where it's going through the city. They can tell me about the city flipping upside and down. And that's because at the end of the day, the universal truth, folks, is that all we ever really care about is spectacle. Mm -hmm. All people really care about is spectacle. Does it, the character is always the second part of the story, meaning that you'll always identify and appreciate the character once you've, once you've really appreciated the story and the spectacle. And that's what we believe that, uh, you know, that we're trying to do. And we believe, again, that everyone who likes good content will appreciate what we're doing, whether you are Black or Brown or Latino or, or, or LGBTQ. We think there's a home for you here at Saturday AM as well. So That's a nice, um, <laughs> like, point to end this. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to get uh, Saturday AM publications, uh, paperback versions will be soon available, uh, if I understood well. So we're currently working with Frederick to uh, to be able to bring them to Quebec uh, to make them available on, on our website. Uh, thank you again, Frederick. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, keep us informed uh, of what's going on with us Saturday AM. And uh, my last word will be for the people who, listen, who are listening. If um, uh, I'll see you in March uh, for the Manga Hour, which will take place on the every uh, each month um, on the last Wednesday of each month at six thirty p.m. Uh, so we will talk about manga news. We will receive different guests. So in short, uh, heavy manga stuff. So uh, it's on Otaku page, and uh, I'll see you there. There. Bye. Thanks again, Frederick. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Okay, so it was <laughs> all right.